a lifetime with someone who is, it was and is so original, so unique, and touched so many people. And through, through him, we got to be able to have a big sense of that. What? David Osman again? No, you're not insane. Welcome to Side 6 as I meet up one more time here at Bob's Berserk Lounge with Fireside Theater's David Osman to talk about the lifetimes and comedy of Peter Bergman. Welcome, friends, to Bereave But Still Me, the podcast formerly known as Heart to Heart with Michael. And now my new co-host is going to read his own bio. Oh, me? Yeah. Gosh. Yeah. Well, uh, 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 David Osman, that's me, is an American writer and performer, uh, best known as a quarter of the Fireside Theater. Our collective work uh, includes comedy, uh, albums, plays, uh, radio shows, uh, so, so much stuff. I'm best known as my role, a, a, as I'm sort of playing, I do this guy named Porgy. Porgy? Hello, Porgy? In uh, uh, on Don't Crush That Dwarf, Hand Me the Pliers. I'm really trying to rush through this because I know everybody knows about this. Oh, yeah. Catherwood the butler, that's famous. He says, uh, he says, uh, what's all this brouhaha? He says, watch all this brouhaha. And uh, then uh, I did an album called How Time Flies uh, with uh, uh, a famous character named Mark Time, a superhero. Everybody loves superheroes. And if you'd like to see me in person, just plug into Disney Plus where I'm making just all kinds of sense. And, and, and uh, as Cornelius, uh, the ant, in a bug's life you want to check in on him because he's really cool you know he's this, this guy <laughs> i've been playing all coot. my life yeah yeah crazy old coot well i think i think that's about it i've done an awful lot of work and we'll probably get around to mentioning it why am i in this voice now see know. michael what you've done with me <laughs> is you, i i am actually the the old guy now but i don't talk i don't talk like him anyway everybody knows who i am and Thanks for thanks for my introduction. Welcome back to Bereave But Still Me. It is a pleasure and an honor. And I got to tell you, I'm just, I'm quelling. Okay. If anybody's <laughs> listening, there's another word quelling, look it up. <laughs> but I'm quelling. <laughs> I love that word. That's one of my famous, my, my favorite Yiddish words. Quelling, well, I'm quelling. If, if you you know just what it means by the sound of it. I know. Isn't it great? So let's start off how you met Peter, because I know that's the story. Peter essentially showed up out of nowhere. He came down the Pacific Coast Highway on a bright red motorcycle and ended up at the studios of KPFK in Los Angeles at exactly the point that we were going through a money raising marathon. And uh, Peter had, as we found out later, uh, come from San Francisco because he really was, there was no action in San Francisco and, and it was nothing he could was doing there and nothing was, and this is San Francisco, 1966, the ferment of the world, you know, is all happening in San Francisco. He ends up in LA, which is like, like, I don't know, Cincinnati. Or Cleveland, you know, Cleveland was where Peter came from, was Cleveland. And uh, he was pretty well known in Cleveland. Uh, his dad worked for newspaper, was a reporter. Uh, they looked very much alike, incidentally. And, um, uh, I, and, and there he was suddenly in the KPFK studios. Who's that? That's Peter Bergman. What's he? Well, we found out that he had uh, just come from the Literarisches uh, Colloquium in Berlin, Germany, uh, uh, where where he where he one of the select authors of you know I mean he had this incredible background. He taught labor economics at Yale. That labor economics. Yeah. Who knows anything about labor economics? You know, <laughs> so so Peter's. Peter was given a, a immediately a late night radio show on KPFK, uh, and this was at the point where the uh, the youth or the youth were beginning to uh, show up in great numbers in Los Angeles as well as in San Francisco, and Los Angeles was in the process of becoming hippified, and Peter Bergman on Radio Free Oz was the basic hippifier of Los Angeles. He had the ability on the radio to read anything from Revelations to Winnie the Pooh and sounded like he was writing it or he had written it or he was the character who was speaking it. Uh, it, it he was really amazing, uh, really amazing. 
Uh, and this gave the image that the audience had, who never saw Peter Bergman, they only heard him, think of this was the Wizard of Oz, this was the R Wizard of Radio Free Oz, because we couldn't say Oz because that was owned by everybody else but us. Okay. His fame spread, as it were. This is in the, in the summer and fall of 1966 when he arrived in LA. And as I said, it was a pretty uninteresting town. Oh yeah, there were movies. Like, you know, I mean, what else? There was no theater. There was nothing in Los Angeles, really dull town. It was certainly not hip. And so Peter's personality just really was successful and made that show work. And the, the other three of us, his old pal, Phil uh, Proctor from Yale and Phil Austin, who was uh, producing the program and me, uh, who was a listener and enthusiast and a dropper in her, became on Peter's whim, the Oz Firesign Theater. He introduced us as that at the very first time the four of us appeared. Peter had had this vision of who he might be as the wizard, and we kicked in right behind him. And the first thing we promoted was uh, the Oz Love Inn, the Love Inn, the very first Love Inn. Yes, there had been a B Inn in San Francisco in, I think, February of 67. In April of 67, uh, uh, we promoted, the, the th four of us on the air on Peter's show, promoted uh, this Love Inn, which was going to happen on Easter Sunday, and, and everybody should show up. Well, we expected, uh, you know, a few hundred people to show up at a leisure park at seven o'clock on a Sunday morning, Easter Sunday morning, thousands turned wow. up, crowds of people wow. kept coming and kept coming. Now, these were not, not your long haired hippies. There were, wasn't such a thing. There were uh, women with flowers in their hair, to be sure. There were uh, some strange uh, uh, clothing. But I mean, you know, this was the very first thing that had happened in Los Angeles that got all these people together. That the revolution started, if there was one. And it was Peter's teepee where he sat as the wizard and people came to visit and pay their respects oh to, to the Wizard of Oz in the teepee. And at the, and that afternoon, uh, we went on the air on KRLA, and he negotiated a, a, a really nice deal, which was um, a thirteen-week run at the um, at the Magic Mushroom, which was an all-ages club on Ventura Boulevard, and it was a three-hour show. I mean, he was going to do you know, interview and we were going to do sketches and plays and whatever at the fireside would appear and do a half hour show every week. This was all under the aegis of Peter Bergman, the Wizard of Oz. Wow. Uh, that we ended up doing those shows and through those shows, he got a call from a producer at Columbia Records. Yeah, Pete, listen, we'd like to do, um, we'd like to do an astrology album with you. And... <laughs> And Peter said, well, you know, I have this comedy group. Thus, our career was born. Wow. I have this comedy group. Well, he didn't have this comedy group. Phil Proctor was in a play in, in, in New York. I had just dropped out from ABC. I'd had this television job, which I just hated. And the four of us together in, in the summer of that, uh, of that year had written Waiting for the Electrician. Because Peter had Peter had not wanted to do an astrology album all by himself because because he was a collaborator as we all were and he understood that with this collaboration a lot more could be said and done by 1970 the Firesign Theater on the radio was doing anything we wanted which mm -hmm. if if you listen to the shows is like nothing like anything anybody had ever heard. Now, Peter couldn't do that by himself, but Peter could make it happen. Why is that? What did he have? Was, was it just connected well or? Oh, his no. It wasn't, it, is his personality? Yeah, I'd say his personality. He parlayed this personality into many, many things. I mean, you talk about, you know, a long resume. For a long time, he was involved with the company that manufactured a piece of equipment that was used in by his heart monitoring equipment that was that was based on a tele on a, a movie editing machine called the Shokron. Peter was a Mac fellow 
Peter knew everybody in the very early days of uh, Macintosh, of, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> that company, Apple, and uh, always had his feet into, into technology in a way that I think none of the rest of us did. He was way ahead of the curve in understanding what was going on in technology, uh, led us in those directions. And as I say, inordinately smart. Peter was really smart. So once we had gotten established as the Firesign Theater, we moved past uh, Peter as a host and moved him into a job as a character. And then very soon after we had done Waiting for the Electrician as an album, it was released early 1968, we had to go on stage. And uh, Peter, who had written uh, a couple of musicals, had never really acted at all. And uh, so one of the things that the three of us who had all been on stage before, uh, had to te- teach him a little stagecraft. Uh, uh, Pete, you're talking upstage, Pete. No, upstage is that way. Downstage. <laughs> you want to turn downstage. That's right, Pete, downstage. Uh, but you know you what? Know, I think he was ready for that. I th- I think from what I'm hearing, that was like the last part of him to be explored and explode outward. I just think it was ready. I think, Michael, you're exactly right. That was. That absolutely was. You are listening to Bereaved But Still Me. If you have a question or comment that you would like addressed on our program, please send an email to Michael Lieben at michael at bereavedbutstillme.com. That's Michael at bereavedbutstillme.com. This content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. The opinions expressed in the podcast are not those of Hearts Unite the Globe, but of the hosts and guests, and are intended to spark discussion about issues pertaining to congenital heart disease or bereavement. I was, right from the beginning, a natural fit with Peter as his sidekick, as his radio sidekick. He could depend on me. I could depend on him. We would always have a good time and we always could feed each other new and interesting material. It was, it was in fact, I told him about the Native Americans. Uh, I said that, Pete, have you ever done any shows about Indians? And he said, what about them? And so there we went. But his general knowledge was, you know, it was, he went to Yale. I mean, he, he taught labor economics. I mean, his general knowledge was, was, um, was immense. He could reach into that general knowledge and make it funny. Peter had the ability to make almost anything funny. And so being his sidekick, feeding him lines, you know what I mean? Being that guy, he's Johnny Carson. I'm the guy on, on the couch. And I loved this. I loved working with Peter this way. And let's, let's go at 50 years or 45 years ahead when Peter lived on the island and established uh, for two years doing uh, a Radio Free Oz as a podcast before anybody had heard of a podcast. Right. This is 2010, for heaven's sake. And uh, it, we did more shows together, more one-hour hits. I think, gosh, we did 120, I think, in, oh, wow. almost in a row because it's it, it ran. He did them five days a week, five days a week. Wow. And I was there every day and had a poem and had wrote comedy and, and uh, just an amazing time with him. And that was just with Peter. As my brother, my long partner, we knew each other very, very well. We'd been through ups and downs and sadnesses and deaths and all kinds of stuff. It was that closeness to him, different than than how I felt about Phil Austin or or how I feel about Phil Proctor. We're close. We love each other. But it was a different thing. In the interim, uh, between the times that we worked very closely together on the stage in the early 80s and when we got back together in the 90s, in that decade, you couldn't keep track of what Peter was doing. As a matter of fact, what all of them were doing were working way ahead in the technological universe Mm -hmm. toward super multi-track records with pictures. And, you know, I mean, all the stuff that really was exciting and went nowhere because nobody was really interested in that. That aspect of technology was uh, truly Peter. Let me ask you something about Peter. 
a visual memory, something when I say Peter Bergman, you automatically think of? Well, we always think of his bald head, don't we? <laughs> well, yeah. Peter's always bald. And uh, it's, it's funny because folks have asked, you know, was there ever a time when he wasn't bald? And yes, there was. There's one picture of him. I know of perfectly well. There's one picture <laughs> that he does have here. I think he's nine or something <laughs> like that. But Send it. We'll put it out. What's your takeaway from your relationship with Peter? What has he left with you that makes you now different for having known Peter? Well, I owe Peter, in a sense, I owe him my career in the Firesign Theater. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure I would have gone on and done interesting things, but without Peter, that simply wouldn't have happened. Um, and I think without all of us pulling together, it wouldn't have happened either. But Peter was the wizard. What I take away from Peter after all of these years is 50 plus years now. I mean, a long, long time. And he's been gone since 2011. You know, he's been gone for a decade. But he's never gone, you see. The yeah. thing that everybody takes away from Peter is the Firesign Theater. Because without him, it simply wouldn't have existed in the first place. And it probably wouldn't have continued in the way it did. Because it required this commitment on, on everyone's part. Everybody had to give up something. And Peter uniquely you know, could carry on doing two things at the same time. <laughs> My memory of Peter is our endless conversations. When he was here at our dining table, when I would stay with him in Los Angeles or Santa Monica, where he was living then, just the endless richness and depth of the conversations. I probably have journals full of actual things that Peter said, you know, that I had to write down. He was the genius. The other three of us are real good, but Peter was a genius. And, I, and without that genius, you know, without that touch of genius, then I would be a different person because I don't, I don't know anybody else <laughs> who, who, who could have touched me that way. A lot of smart people, a lot of good people, a lot of clever people, a lot of good writers, but uh, not not someone that I that I worked with intimately, really intimately, and who sometimes I absolutely couldn't stand, who is absolutely un un unlivable with, you know, who is a heartbreaker who, who uh, uh, could be so terribly difficult, who would never stop rewriting, never have a finished script, never have anything done, you know? Uh, I, what did I learn? I learned to live with that. I learned to live with something that was never done, that was always in two places at once. So take away a lifetime with someone who is, it was and is, so original, so unique, and touched so many people. And through, through him, we got to be able to have a big sense of that. And, and think of the people who treasure the Proctor and Bergman, the pair of them choking together up on stage, running each other up, running each other down, you know, topping, 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 being, a, you know, that act. I couldn't have done that with him. Radio I could do with him. I couldn't have been on a stand-up stage with Pete and done that, you know, totally different. So mm -hmm. Phil's memories of, of, of Peter are, 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 are that kind of intimacy, whereas mine are, are less writing or stage and more really the, 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 the intimacy of, of friendship and knowledge and the, the, the well of creativity that was just you'd drop a bucket in and out it would come day after day after day when we did those last Oz shows. If you've enjoyed listening to this program, please visit our website, heartsunitetheglobe.org, and make a contribution. This program is a presentation of Hearts Unite the Globe and is part of the Hug Podcast Network. Hearts Unite the Globe is a nonprofit organization devoted to providing resources to the congenital heart defect community to educate, empower, and enrich the lives of our community members. If you would like access to free resources pertaining to the CHD community, please visit our website 
at congenitalheartdefects.com. For information about CHD, hospitals that treat CHD survivors, summer camps for CHD families, and much, much more. How do you celebrate him now? Is there something that you think about, something that makes him special? Well, he, you know, his birthday and my birthday are a week apart. Uh-huh. And, and we've all, always, always for 55 years, celebrated our birthday week. His is the 28th of November, <laughs> mine's the 6th of December. So in that week, which often fell between broadcasts, you know, you'd be on the air the next week. Uh, we would uh, read Eeyore's birthday uh, by nice. uh, from from Winnie the Pooh. We read it on the radio, and uh, and I I read it not long ago uh, to a, a, one of those rare uh, pandemic gatherings outside, safely distanced, uh, to a group of friends, and uh, read it again. In it was in in Peter's memory at at. Uh, at that time, late November, early December. So I'll continue doing that. And it will always be Eeyore's birthday. And he'll always have, have a, a, a really nice pot to put things in. And he'll have something nice to put in that pot. And we all will. That's beautiful. I, December 6th is the day I started my first real job. So I will now read it as well. Can I read something? Oh, please, please, please. You know, among, among the things that I have always done is, is been a poet. And uh, so if you, if you want to know, uh, this, is, this, is, this is the last poem in a book called The Old Man's Poems. It's, uh, it's called L'Envoi, which is the, the tribute, the goodbye for, for Peter Bergman. Mm. One. Old man, his friend dies, and the mountain moves to surround and protect him. Two, planets in close alliance dance with the moon, full and gentle, bathing its nearness his way. Three, old man, Back home, old eyes, dim with tears, and old master still occupies this very seat at the old man's left with a view of moonrise. Two, shocking mocker vocalizes, jumps, spinning, showing white wings briefly to the old man sunning, spinning some old dreams. And the second, if you still have time. We have time. So the wizard, 50 days. 50 days for the wizard. Old man takes refuge in the sun. Mockers, songbook, trills and rattles, squeaks, cries out electrical collection of chatter, rambling voice of the city. The city rests in the morning, all of its motions like the old man's body, the silent sum of its working parts. And so the old master, 50 days gone, in the sky, sings, more tunes, sighs and sings again with the voice of birds. Old Pete, old Pete comes again in a raven's call, thinks the old man who understands, get on with it. So that's all you get, Michael. (laughs) <laughs> that's beautiful that's absolutely beautiful and and when when you wrote that when he died yeah that's just beautiful yeah that's it's 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 the i had finished this book called the old man's poems and then he passed away 
So I miss him and uh, probably always will. You are definitely not alone in that. I think I know that anyone whose life was ever touched by him has, uh, has been changed and moved in ways that uh, only, only people who know him can understand. And I'm only looking in from the outside, but I, I, I believe you're right. I, I believe that people are in some sense immortal, that as long as we keep them with us, they're still here. And they have and continue to affect us even when they're not physically here. I believe that deeply. Otherwise, you wouldn't be doing this. This podcast. I would not be doing this program without that. No, this. Yeah, I like to invoke from time to time the Kurt Vonnegut rule, and I'll explain that. He wrote that in New York City, uh, if you meet somebody once, you're entitled to call them your friend. If you meet somebody twice, you're entitled to call them your very good friend. So, my very good friend David Osman, <laughs> thank you so so much. I I cannot tell you how much I I was moved by the things that you had to say. I was glad to be able to do this, uh, particularly with with Peter, who you know, uh, who do deserve to have that poem read. And that was, <laughs> and uh, and so I was happy to be able to do that because that that's the kind of gift you know, uh, the writer's gift. That, it's the writer's gift, exactly. It's been moving in ways that I really didn't expect, and I'm so pleased and and and, and happy that you were able to join us. Thank you. Thank you. This concludes this episode of Bereaved But Still Me, and I want to thank David Osman for sharing his memories about Peter Bergman with us. Please join us next month for a new episode, and I'll talk with you soon. But until then, remember, moving forward is not moving away. Thank you for joining us. We hope you have felt supported in your grief journey. Bereaved But Still Me is a monthly podcast. And a new episode is released on the first Thursday of each month. You can hear our podcast anywhere you normally listen to podcasts at any time. Join us again next month for a brand new episode of Bereaved But Still Me.